So first things first, Mick, Susan, how are you? Good, good. I'm good, thank you. It's very good to hear. So before we get into the album you made together, obviously we have to start at where you first heard about each other. Now, am I right in saying, Susan, you opened or you supported uh, Mick on tour? Um, what was your first impression of Mick? Um, I had I was familiar with, um, I suppose, two of his albums um, beforehand, and I was a fan of his work. I thought he was a great songwriter, lovely voice. Um, but when I heard uh, him playing with the band as well, it was also a, a whole different thing, you know? They've uh, a lovely dynamic from really tender songs to really rocking it up towards the end. So um, it was a pleasure to uh, to be there at those gigs and witness them. Um, yeah, so that that's yeah, that's basically it was it was lovely. And then um, Mick had had asked to well, I was asked to join um, him and his lovely band for a tune at the end of their set. So that's kind of how I first started to jam with them um, in that sense. It was all pretty impromptu and uh, yeah, in the moment. So that was that was cool. And that was the introduction. OK. And Mick, what did you hear in Susan's music that you decided to ask her to, to perform a song on stage together? Well, you know, Susan's a great singer. Um, she had great songs and she had a very natural approach. So, you know, it was kind of, it made sense to see if she was up for uh, joining us at the end of the gig because, you know, it's it's often a nice, it's a nice thing to have the person who was there before kind of return rather than just be forgotten about <laughs> at the, uh, you know. Um, um, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, because Sus Susan's voice is fantastic. So, I mean, it, it, it seems like just the right thing to do. And did you, fr from those instances, did you know immediately that your voices worked well together and then that there might be a future in, in working together? Do you want um, I, I don't, well, I mean, it was definitely pleasure to to share the song but um no I hadn't thought like in a year the whole world will close down and we'll write a concept album <laughs> that part of the journey was definitely unexpected um and an unexpected turn yeah but what was it uh, oh sorry go ahead Mick it was our manager's idea that uh, we might work well together, that our voices might suit together. Um, so that we, it was a, a kind of a good few months later, I think, uh, that we kind of sat down to write a song together for the first time. Uh, but pr actually prior to that, I think Susan had sung on uh, the Baby Talk single. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that, it was that, idea. that baby talk single. Um, so was that just uh, kind of, I don't want to say random that you worked together or that there was no intention uh, involved in that uh, at that moment? Well, it was she, Sheena had spoken about, Sheena being our manager, um, had spoken about the possibility of us doing maybe an EP together. Uh, and... I I had this I had the baby talk melody kind of knocking around in my head and I had no lyrics for it. Um but when Sheena suggested this, I, I kind of it I kind of got got the lyrics finished quite quickly because I liked the idea of it being a duet. Um so you know it was the plan for Susan to sing that song for sure. Um and thankfully she agreed to do it. Um and then after that, so it turned. It just kind of turned, as as the lockdown hit, it it kind of, we just started working on more songs than an EP would take. So it it, it kind of just grew uh, into a, into a full album. 
from a songwriting perspective then and this is for the both of you but what goes into writing a duet opposed to to writing a song just for yourself Mm, um, I guess because this well it's it's unusual Uh, Mick probably wrote more of the duet like narratives so Mm. you should take this on the question (laughs) um it's it's kind of a fun structure to work with uh where like what type of song will allow you to have another narrator interject um so some of them were just kind of uh plain narrator songs as in it was not not driven by the characters um but uh, i think there's three of them uh where they're speaking directly to each other um and they're uh, two of them are, are kind of a a battle or there kind of, baby talk is one of those and then there's one called are we free which is kind of a heightened battle where they're probably not at their best but yeah uh that that type of thing it it, it, it gives you the opportunity to do that type of thing it made me think of um the fairy tale of new york mm. that the way that song was structured um um yeah it's a, it's 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 an interesting way to write because you have you know you have this element available that you can bring in and it, it will lift the song it will change the 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 sound of the song so it's it's a useful tool um yeah i mean we worked on it together a lot we worked on where the where the second voice would enter and what way the second voice would enter would it be in unison harmony uh, would it be given kind of prominence or would it be a kind of a background thing? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a cool, it's a cool way to write. The way it works on particularly this record then, uh, what's the concept of kind of the, the ebb and flow or, or the good and bad of a, re- a romantic relationship? Was that established early on? Um, well, I guess it's in every relationship, but I think that Mick, you had a, that loose story of it being, I suppose, a musical couple and the female character um, is starting to, uh, I think, achieve a little bit more success. And so the male character is put out by that on some level and um but also you know the, the fact that they're a musical couple there is a sense of i suppose heightened drama and you know flashy lights and i guess some sense of of um you know the female character gets to be a bit of a diva at one point um especially in miss me when i'm gone and yeah so so as as well as all of the you know peaks and troughs of of a relationship you have this added dimension of the music industry side of things with the stages and shows which um you know can be can be pretty dramatic <laughs> No, this is something I've heard from from uh, a bunch of artists of, over the years that um, when you decide to pursue a life in music, there, there are certain concessions that go with it. And one of the things I get told a lot is that re- relationships can be difficult. Now, if this is too personal, obviously you can disregard it. But uh, have you found that to be true, that that uh, romantic relationship combining that with kind of the, the life of a touring musician is quite uh, difficult? I certainly found that being on the road a lot, it it definitely, it, of course, it puts a strain, and it, it you you need to definitely be, uh, I think, within a relationship uh, type scenario. If it's going to work, it needs to be two people that are very aware of what it takes to be apart for for a long time. 
while one person is also working very unsociable hours. I mean, like any any couple and if somebody's working on sociable hours, mm. it's going to be difficult. And if they're not around, that's difficult. It's it's a vacancy <laughs> that <laughs> needs to be dealt with at times. So there's some making up to do <laughs> when you get home. Um, yeah. But, but then on the other side, and this is just speculation on my part, but there is this uh, outlet through music of, of kind of the, the things that you might have, uh, the, the, the struggles that you might have with a partner. So does music help in terms of kind of making sense of a relationship or, or how, you, how, how you treat uh, a person in a relationship? I think it depends how much the other person <laughs> is into the music. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Mick, for you then, uh, d- because uh, you started kind of this whole writing process, um, when, what were the songs initially based on? Well, were they based on your personal experience or did you start to talk about uh, the songs with uh, Susan? How did uh, kind of the, the, how would you say, that the sequencing of the albums uh, start to take shape? Take shape. Um, it the the baby talk song was the first one, so it kind of set up it set up the relationship theme, um, and I, it was kind of based on that song and 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 the are we free kind of relationship fight song, are both kind of based on gen- just general universalities between uh, two people when they're trying to uh, be in a relationship together, just. The general misunderstandings and the insecurities and jealousies and things like that that, that come up. Um, the there was a couple of songs that kind of just drifted me towards the the idea that Susan's character had kind of become too successful for for my character to kind of deal with, or or that, that their lives drifted apart by virtue of that happening. Mm. Uh, there was uh, the the song Ghost, which is the last song. Uh, that was that came kind of early in the batch, and that's the, just it. It just kind of and it, the fact that it came early in the batch meant that it kind of it did kind of dictate a bit backwards because it was the end. They were over, and they she was clearly you know, too big to even see him backstage kind of thing. Um, so it, it just happened, whatever way the lyrics were kind of coming, that's just the way it happened. Uh, I didn't really set out to write that story, but it, that that song kind of retrospectively put put a kind of a theme on things. And then, yeah, the song In The Game also had a kind of a similar nostalgia to it. Um, which was like it was just uh, I guess myself and Susan both have our experience with what it's like to be on stage it's it's not a very natural experience it's not um, it's not a normal thing to be doing really uh, and it has its it has its effects on people and um, it has a, it has an adrenaline effect it has a kind of a modesty kind of effect you wonder about who you are, public facing and private facing. You wonder about what levels of attention might be doing to your personality. You wonder if it's good for you at all. You wonder if <clears throat> you wonder if it's even an attractive thing for someone else to be in a relationship to, you know, because it's you know it's kind of a it's a strange <laughs> circus life that you live. With that in mind, then, and this might be a strange question, but why why go into it? What why venture? What is the payoff, so to say, from being on stage? Um, I don't know. I guess life is boring sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it gives you a kick. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let, let me ask you then, Susan, what, what made you delve into this this life of music? And obviously you grew up around music and all that stuff, but what made you, because it isn't always as easy, let, let me put it that way. So, so, so what, 
what makes it worth it uh, doing this thing that's called music? <laughs> yeah, what makes it worth it? Um, I mean, making sound is pretty cool. And when it's blasting out through some nice speakers and you're there with, you know, people that also make sounds that you like and it's all just mixing in this cacophony of of something that will never happen again the same way twice. That's pretty good. Um, it's it's lovely to share that with people that truly appreciate um, to see the cathartic side of music when somebody's genuinely shifted something inside themselves um, because I think sound does that um, for people um, in a very, very profound way that maybe we still haven't even, you know, unveiled um, with, with, with science and, and with, I suppose, yeah, we, maybe our knowledge of music has still, has still got a, a little bit of a journey to go on. But I think that's the payoff is, is doing that. And it also comes with a whole load of smoke and mirrors. And it's important to know that and always know that because, you know, I mean, the the sound system definitely helps and so does the lights and definitely <laughs> the smoke machine. So. <laughs> well, um, yeah. with, with what you mentioned and the, the sonic landscape that uh, and then the musicality of, of, of side of it, um, what were the challenges, if, if there were, were any, in, in kind of figuring how to use your voices together? Um, challenges. Uh, Supposed to just giving enough space and making sure that, uh, making sure that, uh, like, I know Mick has a very, you know, you have a wide range of notes to use. Um, so, you know, approaching some songs, whether it's to hit it, you know, with the full punch or sing something delicately and knowing when to back off as well, you know, space is really important, I think. Mm. Um, I felt like they were very natural obstacles more so than challenges that we just, that was part of the the kind of puzzle in working out a, a section of songs and finding how they, they would fit the best. Right. Were you able to be in the same room together for this process at all? At times, yeah. Uh, for, for both recording sessions, we were. You know, we had three or four days in Dublin initially, and then we had five, I think, days in Cork, where we were all together with the with the band, and we we either read re redid some songs from from beginning, or we just added the band on to existing vocals that we had done. Um. Yeah, and for the writing, unfortunately, we we had to kind of work apart mostly because it, the restrictions for lockdown were much um, much more strict at that time. Right. So, in terms of the studio work, then, um, how do the sonic landscapes that that form uh, eventually form a song? start to take shape for instance some songs have horns on on them some some have strings how do, how do you kind of navigate whatever it is that you are able to put on it and then figuring out what a song needs well we had a number of phone calls with tony buchan who was the kind of producer from me working out of los angeles and we would have uh uh, I think we worked off our early demos. He would listen to them through whilst we were there on the call, uh, on a call like this. And uh, we would make notes. He would ask for extra, an extra few bars of intro. He would ask for, or he would just kind of tell us what he was envisioning for which part. Um um, I, I can't remember exactly. There wasn't too many cuts or 
there wasn't too much of a kind of a knife taken to our original arrangements. He was just, he was happy to add to what we had demo wise. Um, we added a couple of int intros and uh, some extra musical parts and some extra musical endings as well, like, you know, just to give air and room to the instruments rather than our voices. Um, but it all kind of came from our earlier demos, really. We had the songs in pretty good shape by the time we brought them to Tony. Okay. Now, there's, a, there's one song in particular, um, because last time I spoke to you, Mick, we talked at, at some length about the notion of free will. And now there's yeah. a song on the album called Freedom, which I believe Susan, you wrote, but I'm not sure. Um, so so I'll, I'll ask you then, what, what is it? Because I wrote a line down from that song. Um, uh, freedom is a place in the mind. So how do you feel about uh, kind of a sense of free will? Oh, <laughs> the free will question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm still, in, in terms of free will, I'm still on the fence whether it truly exists um, in the in the broader sense, uh, but I do think that we have choices along the way. Um, no, you don't. Micro choices, <laughs> which is, <laughs> but but I do think that we can. I do think that we can navigate our approach to. Uh, what is happening and we can choose how we are going to let ourselves feel about it and and that whether that whether we're going to have resistance or whether we're going to flow with what is happening whether that's by our own design or a greater thing and um the place in the mind i guess is just about finding finding that that little kind of oasis that you can tap into in the self that maybe alludes to having free will that we don't really have. <laughs> what, what just popped into my head is, is because it's uh, within this context of this uh, uh, musical couple, it, it's then kind of, kind of that place in the mind. Is that then part of the smoke and mirrors at, at times? Kind of that you will yeah. something to be a certain way or you try to force to, to perceive something a certain way? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of think that all of life is really smoke and mirrors. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing really is real, uh, uh, you know? And the more I, I guess, pay a little bit of attention to what's being said about about our physical reality and our dimensional reality, I, uh, it, it, it's not really a reality at all. So um, I guess the place in the mind is, is, is another, is a fictional kind of construct to, to kind of say, is it, is, it, is it there? I mean, what even is a mind? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think as um, as you mentioned, I think science has hasn't gotten that far yet. We we don't know what our consciousness is exactly and all that stuff. So it's 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 definitely food for thought. I, I love those kind of conversations. Um, Mick, for you then, um, within this kind of uh, larger context, is there one song that specifically sticks out for you in terms of uh, that story that you wanted to tell? With regard to free will. Well, not necessarily free will, but just that story of that uh, musical couple, because you mentioned kind of the more more uh, relationship fight uh, songs. Uh, were there some? Well, let me phrase it differently. Well, was there one song in particular that that sticks out to you in terms of what you wanted to tell in this story? Um. I'm trying to scan my mind through the songs. Uh, there's almost too many songs on the album. <laughs> but I, 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 I've enjoyed singing the, the last song with Susan, the, the song called Ghost. Um, I don't know. There's something, especially with a live setting as well, where you're singing it in front of a live audience, it's very kind of circular. You are the person singing the song about the person singing the song to the audience, singing about the audience. And uh, it, I don't know, it's, uh, 
I guess it it becomes a bit meta. <laughs> but um, I also like the fact that it kind of changes key every ten seconds. Uh, I'm kind of nerdily proud of that one. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Well, you mentioned something, or you, or you allude to something, which is the live shows. And now, obviously, when you were working on this uh, album, I would imagine uh, live shows were out, completely out of the question. So now that you've been able to perform some of the songs live, and, and have they shifted for you, or have they evolved in, in any way? Uh, do you want to answer that, Mrs? Oh, uh, well... Yeah, they've definitely evolved for me. Um, I, I was curious as to how they would transfer. Um, but yeah, no, it's, I mean, we're still, it's still very early. I think we've just done a small few gigs over the last week. Mm. And um, it seems to, this the storyline seems to be a really lovely thing to include the audience in. And to get to, you know, um, in a way, it's it's those fighting, those dueling couple songs, you know, it's kind of like having a battle on stage with somebody musically, which is not something I've done before as well. So that that's been great. Yeah, I can imagine uh, on stage that's a very different energy than when you're just standing there alone, and now you have this person to kind of uh, rest. Re I don't, I don't know how to pronounce that word. Reciprocity? I don't know how to word. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean, uh, to, to kind of bounce that idea off, uh, uh, off each other. Well, it, how, how, how does that feed into kind of the live energy? Um, it's hard to say. For, like, I guess it's the, it does add to the drama, all right, with those songs where we're seeing nasty things to each other on stage in front of people it has a kind of a theatrical yeah. kind of element to it um which is cool like i mean it's good <clears throat> that there you know that the two voices are addressing each other rather than just kind of performing some kind of expositional thing um uh yeah and like susan has kind of added different arrangements to some to that one of the one of those songs in particular she's added the trumpet to the end of it to kind of give it a bit more of a lift yeah we've had to kind of adapt the songs to the, the, the dynamics of the songs have to be kind of molded into something that will suit just the two of our voices and whatever instrument we have at that time because we don't have always bass and drums and we don't have all the tools to make things rise up in, in dynamic sound. So we have to kind of lower the ceiling a little bit and start start a bit lower so that we when we get there, we, we've actually had somewhere to go. <clears throat> yeah. Final question then. Um, with this album, especially because the future is still as uncertain as it is, what do you hope this album, or, or let me, do, do, you, do you have any expectations for this album? in terms of what you will be able to do in the future because of it, or, or the collaboration between the two of you? Well, we, uh, we're going on a, a tour for three weeks of the US um, in the next two days, it starts. And then following that, we're doing a tour of Europe and Ireland. And but with the Irish tour, we'll have a band, mixed band, that he normally plays with, who who are great musicians. So, I mean, for now, it's let's let's go on the road and see where the songs go and play them every which way they kind of they come out on the night. And and I think that's the to get to travel with music again is a lot of expectations filled after the last two years. Right. Well, the, the, in, one last thought then, because. Uh, Whenever you release an album, which which I don't know if it's if it's fair to call it a concept album, but but what do you hope uh, that people who hear it take away from it? Um, I would kind of hope that they kind of get into the characters a little bit and kind of get drawn into the world of what it's trying to kind of. Um, 
uh, portray. Um, I don't know. Like, I guess the I guess the ultimate goal is that you that the the listener will achieve some type of empathy for both of them, even though both of them are quite flawed. Um, uh, aside from that, I, I don't know. I, I I hope people enjoy them just as as kind of musical pieces, even if people aren't too given to caring about what the lyrics mean or what the story might be. I, I just kind of hope they enjoy it sonically. Uh, like I'm quite proud of it as an album. I, I like it. Um, I'm glad that we that we got it made. Um, uh, yeah. It's hard, it's hard to know what, what to think about expectations, you know, because when you've just made something, it can feel a little bit close to you. And you can you wonder sometimes that you... Uh, you know, is is there are there should I be having big expectations for this? But like I've had those in the past, and they, they haven't always come to uh, to meet the hope. So I've decided not to hope anymore. <laughs> well, you you've done well for yourself, I would say. And, uh, so uh, is that still a worry? Kind of how how or is that kind of the 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 plight of the artist? And whenever you put something out, you always worry a bit about how it will be received. Um, I don't know. It depends how, if you're proud of it yourself, then you can probably live with any reception. Um, so yeah, I don't, yeah, I am quite proud of this one. So I, I, I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, on those words then Mick, Susan, thank you so, uh, so much for taking the time to talk with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Robin. nice to talk Cheers. to you again.